welcome back to another episode of Talk Dead to Me, the only Walking Dead podcast with the testicular heft to start at season 10. I am quoting Simon because this week we are talking to Simon, Stephen Ogg himself. Before we get to that, let's introduce the host. We have Alexander August. She is our podcast producer. We also have Woody Tondorf. He is our Skybound Games producer. We just have a gaggle of producers here today, as we always do every week. Guys, how's it going? Terrific. I'm, I'm, I'm into it this week. It's going, to, going okay. We are getting down to the end of our Talk Dead to Me reanimated series where we are watching iconic episodes from each season. This week, we are covering season eight, episode 15, Worth. This is also known as the Simon Death episode, but so many other amazing things happen. Woody, what can the good people look forward to? First of all, welcome back, everybody who stuck with us. I mean, we, you, you make the dream work. And for new people, what a choice. Bold moves. Nobody tells you what to do. Well, what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about winners and losers, uh, the people who were the shining stars of the episode and those people who were the lowest of the low. And then we've got Apocatips, uh, everybody's favorite uh, segment, except Alexandra's, where we go into uh, what the, something from this episode has taught you how to do in today's semi-apocalypse. Uh, and then huge, fantastic, incredible guest. I didn't think we could do better than Shiva last week, but for real, uh, Stephen Ogg, a.k.a. Simon, I'm told is on the pod. My boy, what a what a guy! Um, I'm I'm excited to hear what this dude has to say because the, the dude just leaps off the screen and absolutely everything he does, whether that's TV, film, video games, what have you. Uh, and then if we've got time, we're gonna pick up the pieces of our lives and and things that we liked in the episode didn't make it into segments called stray arrows. Love it. Um, before we get into all of that, I just want to make some quick uh, breaking news updates. Uh, just. Hours earlier, uh, we wrapped our Skybound Expo. This is our 10-year anniversary online convention. And uh, we made some really exciting announcements. We had some awesome panels. Um, the two biggest announcements that you guys will probably care about is uh, The Walking Dead Deluxe was announced. Uh, if you guys are unfamiliar with The Walking Dead comics, it always came in black and white. And now we have announced that we are re-releasing the series one issue at a time in color. Uh, we had David McKay uh, do the color and some of the and all the covers, I think. And it is going to look so great. If you guys want a little taste of that, go to our website, see it in color. It is beautiful. Very excited about that. Also, uh, we made some casting news for uh, Invincible, the anime yes. series. That is Robert Kirkman's other comic uh, that is very, very popular very about exciting. superheroes. Yes, this animated series, it's going to come out on Amazon. I can't tell you when, but eventually, and you won't have to wait too long, and it's very exciting. Um, we have Steven Yoon is playing the lead character, and we have uh, some other Walking Dead actors that are going to be involved as well. But today, specifically, we announced that Kari Payton, you guys know him, Ezekiel himself, <gasps> he is going to be playing Black Samson. That's very exciting. We also have Zachary Quinto, for those American Horror Story fans, he is going to be playing Robot. And um, for anyone it who's missed Heroes any of the- fans. And Star Trek fans. I'm, I'm so surprised that, Alexandra, you just skipped right over that. Like, Spock <laughs> himself is playing uh, is playing Robot. Like, that's amazing. I can't, I cannot wait for this. Anyone who's uh, missed any of the previous announcements, I mean, guys, this project is stacked. It's an animated series, but it's going to be rated R. It's going to look awesome. I'm very excited about it. We also have J.K. Simmons in this, Sandra O, oh, Gillian <gasps> Jacobs, Mark Hamill, Zazie Beetz, Obviously, Kari Payton, Walton Goggins, Seth Rogen, uh, Jason Manzukis, uh, oh, man. Andrew Rannells. I mean, it it's just goes on and on and on. Kevin Michael Richardson. So very excited about this series, guys. It's one of the things that Skybound is working on that I am most excited for. Anyway, speaking of show, we have our own show to get to, and that is Talk Dead to Me. Let's start it off. This week, we covered episode 815, Worth, directed by Michael Slovis, written by David Leslie Johnson. McGoldrick, try to say that four times fast, and also Corey Reed. Very exciting, a lot of, uh, a lot of great talent behind this episode. Um, not only did Simon die, but Eugene got captured and then used a surprise vomit technique to get out of it, um, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then, you know, Simon and Negan finally had their final showdown. There's also some great bits with Gregory, and I just can't wait to get into this. Let's just cut the bullshit and get right to winners and losers. Um, I'm going to start us off. My winner, as I just mentioned, is Eugene. Eugene is an escape artist. He is fantastic. I, I've seen this scene like a thousand times where he vomits on Rosita and then hides in this comically large pile of ash. And I still laugh every time I look at it. It is 
fantastic. If you're in a zombie apocalypse, and maybe this can be an apocalypse as well, you need to learn to do things on command, like throw up, okay? I'm not suggesting you develop a serious eating disorder. I'm just saying you, you just need to learn how to get out of sticky situations by getting sticky yourself. I can't believe that you just glossed over his like absolutely pitch perfect for today, like beratement of Gabriel to like, don't wear the mask. Yeah. Don't sneeze around all these people. Wear your fucking mask because you probably are contagious. Like, I can't have you getting all of these people sick. Like, go sit in that corner. Like, Osha Eugene yes. is, is fantastic. It is really, like, it was incredibly portentous. Just period. And this entire, like, this entire series just feels, like, oddly, like, now, like, deja vu. But then mm-hmm. also the fact that this coincides with this being the Gabriel that I really don't like. Like, this is my least favorite form of Gabriel. I always, like, my eyes roll out of my head when he would come on and be scared and sad and either be crazy or spiritual uh yeah it went together like i feel the same way about this kind of gabriel that i do about people who don't wear masks i have so many opinions on people who don't wear masks it makes me mad every day (laughs) it's been well covered on this podcast very very well covered especially under the happy apocalypse music which by the way i am sorry has been missing the past few weeks i i lost the file and i had found i had been digging for hours and hours on this copyright free music site and I've been, I was kind of moving files around my computer and it somehow got lost in the shuffle. I am trying to locate it for future episodes. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, how, how do you, how do you do that? Are you like Zoolander, like throwing your computer off like a ledge or something? How did you, it's, it's one file. You, you use it weekly. How did you do that? <laughs> Uh, well, I have a computer made for ants, so it's, you know, what am I going to do? Just, uh, just go to your loser, Johnny. <laughs> Wow. So already disappointed in me. Fantastic. Um, just, my loser just is uh, Johnny O'Dell. He is a dumb idiot <laughs> who loses important files that make the podcast better, and um, he should burn in hell. Uh, my other loser is the communal form of Negan. So we've been taught the last two seasons to fear not just Negan himself, played by Jeffrey Dean Morgan, but just the communal thought of Negan. Everyone is Negan. We're all bought in. And Simon definitely takes up you know the gauntlet of Negan once he kind of disappears him and takes over the saviors but there's only one Negan and he proved that this episode when he waltzes back into the sanctuary with his bat comes back right into the conference room for the you know the all staff and just you know (laughs) runs shit and he immediately I mean thanks to Dwight but immediately you know sniffs out the detractors kills them and then has an ultimate showdown with his biggest rival uh, within his ranks. So there is only one true Negan, RIP, the communal form. I am, dude, that is exactly what I took away from, like, what I liked about this. I wrote, in, like, in several points in my notes, I was like, Negan is the smartest person in the room for almost, for, like, and you, but you keep seeing, it's, the entire episode is just this, like, Shakespearean machination, like, political machination of two people, of people, like, agreeing and disagreeing to try and kill different people. And then Negan just comes in and basically in maybe two or three fell swoops, eliminates all of the threats to him and reassumes power. It was just, um, it was a fun character study for him. Yeah, I like that you said Shakespeare. Like, he's got a few, like, yeah, terrific moments. Like, the whole, like, uh, when he's choking the life out of Simon. And he's yes. like, now, I've like, look what you've got. I've got to kill you because every someone's always going to try to skate. And now I have to murder all these people. It's yeah. like, wow, that's excellent. Also, pour one out for all of those poor saviors who went with Simon's plan. And they're like, finally, I've been in middle management this whole time. Like, <laughs> now is my time to finally <laughs> skip the line. And they get fucking shot for it. And yeah. then their faces, like, Super smashed clean. in with a baseball bat. Like, oh, God. Woody, give us your winners and losers, please. Uh, my winner uh, for the episode is Carl. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's it's the the, re- the episode, because it's all on Simon and Negan and all that stuff. But the, the rapper of the episode uh, is Carl's posthumous dunking on both of the leaders of the factions by basically like sends a, a, a lovely uh, letter to his dad um, that's just like very moving and terrific. Uh, also, like well done uh, Georgia educational system because Carl's handwriting is impeccable. It's very uh, good. Everybody is able to read his notes like perfectly legible. It's great. Um, also, like near death has given Carl like next level uh like perspective and the ability to just like boil down the entire conflict in a way that like, where was this a season ago or that sort of thing. 
Um, like this is from the same kid who hid in a truck and tried to just murder a bunch of saviors just because that seemed like a good idea at the time. And now he's like breaking down like political structure and like emotion and motivation. Oh yeah. Um, he fully, he's like, fully it, Buddha. Yeah. And just to the point that like Michonne reading Carl's words to Negan just oh. devastates this guy, like yeah. down to his boots to the point that he yeah. has to like just absolutely obliterate it. his walkie talkie. Yeah. Like it he's, works. Like, like this is not something that feels cliche or overly sentimental at all. I was surprised at how well Carl being this sort of like Zen master from the grave didn't like actually land it really beautifully. Yeah. He was on some Morgan shit by the, uh, mm. by the end with those notes and it was like, mm. but it was great that, So uh, everybody else is like just, you know, fighting in the mud and in the dingy uh, hallways of the sanctuary. And Carl is out here in the afterlife just (laughs) telling people how it is. So like, Carl, you you may be dead, but you won the episode. Winning from the grave. Who's your loser, Woody? Um, My dunked on, or sorry, uh, my loser for the episode is uh, is Gregory. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, this dude. I like... I would love to see a version of all of these events from Gregory's point of view, but it's done with the cinematography and the uh, and the tone of Veep on HBO. Mm. Like the <laughs> yes, we, yes. Like the the whole conversation that he has with Simon about having the juice, like mm. just yes. killed me. I wanted that so for like forty five minutes. The juice. Like oh my god, everything that Gregory does is just like he's he's so wonderful at being despicable. That you just mm-hmm. watch this like slimy dude and like to go to uh, Battlestar Galactica, like he's a dingier Gaius Baltar, but he's also not as smart. Oh my god! Yeah, so he's he just knows sure that makes like, sense to some of you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, like three people were like, "Oh yes, excellent reference." Yeah, the rest of the people have yeah have hit the fifteen second skip. I have um like that was my uh, I favorite scene of this episode period like for some reason i think just because um there's there's a difference between binging and watching these with like the in, the, the attention set for this podcast and all of a sudden i kind of blinked and i was like these guys are basically the same person meeting in the middle and i absolutely fucking love this scene like these two so guys good. are have basically been these obsequious, slimy, smarmy, self-promoting climbers, but it but it manifests in different way. And this mm-hmm. is their this is like them coming together and finally realizing that they're like, oh, soulmates. To go back to like the Veep thing, I wanted to see like the Dwight betrayal where he's like, take this map, get out of here, you only have this play done to like Veep does these great bits where they keep the story going in the uh, in the post credits oh, as like yes. the credits are rolling. So you see like a press conference or something like that, and it's usually like follows one character and how they're just a massive fuck up. Yep. And just the idea that like Gregory takes this, gets in a car, goes to Hilltop, ends up in jail again, and like hands them this note and like, here, take it. And of course the note's a fucking trap. Like it's just Gregory you have shit the bed so completely in this episode. It's magnificent. <laughs> Alexandra, give me your winners and losers. Uh, my winner this week is Negan for reasons we basically already discussed. Um, I would also kind of say my winner would be Aaron because boy, Ooh. did he need a helping hand this episode in Oceanside. Finally oh, kind God. Of, like, uh, like pun was, intended I, with the helping I hand thing. But this, <laughs> oh, oh, that was unintentional. I'm sorry. Um <laughs> But also just like I playing that to the Veep music as well. Like if this was the Veep interpretation of Aaron's whole thing, I kept for some reason in my head, I was like, is he f- that first that first time that he kills the walker and then basically collapses in front of them and they walk past him? That just was for some reason hysterical to me. And I kind of wish that he just looked up <laughs> as they passed him and been like, yeah, I was faking it shit. Um, and this was <laughs> kind of more communicated. <laughs> but it's season eight of The Walking Dead and it was very, very emotionally extra. So it wasn't like wasn't like that but um my loser were uh my losers are simon and gregory shippers and burned burned so fast and so short it um that mostly just harkens back to what i was saying earlier about that particular scene and how it was so fun to see these two odious characters just really sit down and like lean into the relationship that they kind of hint at um at the top of bigger scenes throughout the series like we've seen them confront each other with you know more formally when simon comes to basically grab tribute from hilltop and that's kind of how we learn who simon is and stuff like that is through the simon gregory relationship so having them sit down and be in but it's it's a lot of show so having them sit down and be really authentic with one another in in the most disgusting odious self-serving way possible was just uh, (laughs) it was great i wanted to see them get a spinoff I would have loved an alternate universe where, like, somehow, like, through weird, like, bullshit, 
those two end up getting like spun off from like the rest of like the saviors and have to go and like start their own like imagine them leading like the trash people well not simon but like leading some like community or like they <laughs> i want to see gregory and simon as the stormtroopers from the commonwealth Oh, I man. think that that would be that oh, would be some man. fun energy. I want to see them as that. like Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, and they're a couple. Oh, perfect! Like, I think you can plug yeah, them into man. anything, and that dynamic just wins. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it really does. Now let's move on to apocalypse. Look, guys, as Woody said, we are in a semi-apocalypse, and we need all the help we can get. So thankfully, the three of us are here to help you through this year. And so we're going to take tips that we learned from the episode and apply them to real life. Here are the apocalypse. Uh, Woody, why don't you start us off? Well, first of all, I want to clarify that I'm, I'm not here to help you. The, being Listening to this podcast is not a covenant in which I provide aid to you, the listener. No, we, we are just on this journey no. together in two meat vehicles. We are not legally an- responsible for all these listeners. No. So, yes. Yeah, what, you, you people do whatever the heck you want. I am not your parent. Like, go, go and live your lives, okay? Like, just, just enjoy yourself. But wear a fucking mask. Yeah. Don't, be, don't be an asshole. Anyways, uh, my apocalypse is uh, if, you're in, if you're engaged in a one-on-one death match for control of your faction don't you don't win pretty just win and that includes smacking a dude in the mouth with your elbow in the middle of a sentence while you rock the mic like it's a wwe match like that was magnificent like that it was at once like surprising but also peak simon and yes. just like, and like, just encapsulate everything that was going on in that episode. And even Negan had this moment of like, "Oh, okay, shit, it's well, on." It was, and so like, it was great because it upped the stakes of that fight for a minute. Because for a minute, you weren't totally sure who was going to win. Like for a hot second. Yeah, I do wonder. Like it, to go back to the uh, to Johnny's loser of the communal Negan. Like, had Simon won that fight, would he have come out of it and been like, "Okay, I'm Negan. We're still all Negan. Okay, though we, I just take on the mantle like the Batman. Like, or is he just kind of like, no, fuck that noise. I'm Simon. I guess we're all Simon. Like, that's a conversation oh, he had with himself. That we'll never know. Him. Yes, it, that was known to Simon only, and we, we'll never know the answer <laughs> to that question. I love how also like when Gregory does the totally expected Gregory thing that wasn't a surprise at all, which is trying to get away as soon as no one is looking. They cut away from this fight, this very important fight between two major characters, to allow Gregory to leave. And like this violence is this is such a way of life on this show and a way of life for the saviors that they were like okay cool so it's been going on for 30 seconds all right let's cut to this and get that out of the way then come back and then simon dies it's yeah Yeah, it's not a pretty fight it's not the daredevil hallway fight or like these are just Mm. two sweaty guys throwing haymakers like eventually (laughs) like they're it's like when you play like Street Fighter and you don't know any of like the like the attacks or the combos. You're pausing every two seconds to be like, "How do I Hadouken?" Like it's just dudes throwing heavy punches. Yeah, like, that's that's not you, you can cut away from that. If this was a video game, I would like approach the NPCs before the fight and just see like how much they're betting for each one because you know they're like, "All right, I'm <laughs> I'm gonna put fifty meal points on Simon," and they're like, "No way!" And it's like, "Take a bet with me." You know, there's a lot of side betting happening. For my pocket tip. Uh, you know, they say you can't double cross a double crosser. Well, that's not true. Uh, cause Dwight did it. He, he double crossed a double crosser who was Simon and it mostly worked until Dwight got, you know, got, he got double crossed at the end. So everyone's double crossing everybody. I guess the moral of the story is you can double cross a double crosser. Just be careful who finds out about it. That's all. Snitches get stitches or they get tied up for the next episode and then get sent to the spinoff show. Or also snitches like survive the murder attempt and like hide in a ditch and eventually make it their mission to get back to the sanctuary to rat you out to Negan. Yeah, snitches get forced to Texas to look for their uh, lost wife. Alexandra, send us home. What is your apocalypse tip? Okay, so there are redeemable villains in the post-apocalypse and there are irredeemable villains. You need to decide like right away which kind of villain are you. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, it's important because you can get really far and and still get got. Simon is an excellent example of that because he was fully, fully irredeemable. And also, this is mostly just a comment on the fact that um, this was, or this is partially to comment on the fact that this was kind of an episode where we get to see why Negan is redeemable. And it just made the end of this conflict way more interesting because, I mean, granted, Negan has kind of made himself a little bit more three-dimensional, but this was a really good episode to actually see how much sometimes he really doesn't like his job. And right. he's starting to see, yeah, like, and he's starting to see that, like, just that last speech that what you mentioned in Simon's dying face is he's like, 
you didn't stick around. Now the hill now they're gonna think that they always have a loophole or an out. So now I have to yeah. kill them all because right. this is how he's kept order. And we've seen him show that he cares about people. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's just that they're this like practical resource. We've seen him show that, and now this is him being forced to kill lots of them. So we kind of see the reluctance in Negan and the exhaustion of being this having this much blood in his hands, really. And that was just um I like that. I like how you said that choose what kind of villain you're going to be because in an apocalypse, you're going to be forced to be a villain to someone. Even if you think you're the hero, you're not. You're a hero in your own story. That's always true. But you're going to be the villain to someone else. This is why I added Rick to the villain bracket years ago and got all the shit for it on Twitter because, you know, Rick is a villain to so many groups. If you're Terminus, Rick is the villain. If you're Woodbury, Rick is the villain. You know, if you're Sanctuary, Rick is the villain. So... Uh, deciding what kind of villain you're going to be and how you redeem yourself is very important. And also, R.I.P. the saviors who in the next season try to redeem themselves by like integrating into society, but Oceanside does not forget, and they <laughs> they will murder no. all of you. They will shut all that shit down. <laughs> um, all right, that wraps up Apocatips. I hope you guys use all of these pieces of advice in real life because it looks like Uh, Things aren't getting better because people refuse to wear a mask because, um, you know, I've been told by friends you shouldn't call these people dumb. But, you know, I I guess I'll just have to develop new vocabulary words for these people who think that wearing a mask is some kind of, you know, personal oppression. Let us get to our guest. Uh, We've been talking about him all podcast. I can't shut up about him because I had such a delight full-time talking to him. It is Stephen Ogg. He played Simon. You also know him from GTA 5. You know him from Westworld and a million other things. And I can't wait for you guys to hear it. So without further ado, roll it past me. All right. Our guest this week is the unforgettable actor who played Simon in The Walking Dead. You guys obviously also know him from Westworld. The Tick, Snowpiercer, which just finished its first season. Season two, coming soon. Stephen Ogg, how you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? You know, I'm doing well. Um, good, being, been... good being relative. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's a sliding scale. You know, 50 out of 100 is probably the best someone could really be doing in quarantine right now. Um, I say it's, it's a good day, bad day, wash and repeat. That's what I've been saying. Yeah, so your Instagram is actually really interesting, especially following it during quarantine, because you've been playing the banjo, you've been doing farting uh, sit-ups, you've been doing all sorts of uh, fun things. What have... Well, those <laughs> were... Listen, there's, uh, the Instagram is, you know, social media is, is what it is. And I think uh, one has an opportunity to uh, do something positive. It's much better. So it's, you know, uh, all I do is Instagram. I don't do anything else. And it's sort of a platform with which you can kind of do what you want. And I try to just at least provide some sort of, you know, a, a, a art gallery, I call it. I just get to go in and do some writing and put something up there. And ideally with a message of some sort of hope or, you know, whatever the struggles are, we all have struggles. And sometimes, yeah, in that case, doing yoga on the, the mat in the morning, that sweat. And I yeah. just found myself the the sweaty back on the the mat, the fart sounds, and you're immediately 12 years old, laughing about a fart sound. And I just thought, this is kind of really lovely to share because even though you wake up feeling like a pile of shit and you do what you need to do to come on, buddy, here we go. You can do it today. You can <laughs> you can do something today. Uh, it's moments like that that I try to capture, be it in writing or, you know, it is somewhat of a fabrication, obviously. It's not real time. People yeah, tend to much- think like it's all real time. Like, no, 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 no. That could have been written a year ago. And I just, I just pick and paste and. Yeah, because you have sort of um, all of your posts are basically poetry, at least the captions are. And then you even have a separate account. (laughs) People think I do drugs. They're like, what drugs are you on? Because half the time, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But if you dig deep, you you find it. They're just, they're an emotional, you know, this test is to provoke an emotional response. And I think they're just, uh, you know, they're there to, to get you to, to get you to think and to feel hopefully and and to know that we're all in this together. You know, we tend to view certain people a certain way and it's like, no, 
we're, we're all in this together and we all uh, feel pain and we all suffer and we feel joy and we feel love and we feel loss and we feel frustration. And that's just my way of, of sharing it. If I was a songwriter, I would write a song and post it, but I can't do that. So I just do my little blah. What's it been like to not be on set for, what is it, five months now? Um, or have you been on set? Yeah, I've been working on set. No, <laughs> no one else in the world, just me. Production I just talked world. to Michael Cudlitz and he said he just got done filming them like a movie and they were social distancing and it sounded like a nightmare. Yeah, they've, there, there's been some production and I know up in Canada, Vancouver is, is starting. And now, of course, down in America, things have, I believe, and as they should be delayed again yeah. because yeah. of the shit show that is going on here. Um, I mean, the, the, the misconception, especially with me, is when I work even on all these shows, like the ones, you know, Westworld or Walking Dead, Snowpiercer, I'm, I'm only working maybe two to three days a month sometimes. So it's, wow. it's a misconception that people have because you're on a show or, oh, you're in every show. I'm very fortunate. I'm very lucky and grateful to be on these big shows. But, I, you know, unless, unless you're top, three or four on the call sheet, you're a part of the world. So you're going to, or, you know, you're going to work a little bit, not, not all the time. So the start of the quarantine, I was like, this is no different for me. I spend weeks on end just scratching my head thinking, okay, I, I got to be productive today. The only right. difference in the first part of the phase one was that I couldn't maybe go to my local craft beer place to have my 5 p.m. old man beer. Uh, other than that, it, it didn't really change much. So what I miss are, yeah, being on a location, shooting, friends, having that focus, uh, that I miss. But again, even if, you know, if we were shooting right now, again, I'd probably be working five days a month, possibly. Have there been any silver linings for you during this quarantine? Like anything you learned about yourself or new skills you picked up? The banjo, sadly banjo. enough, I started, but I haven't, I have not played it in six weeks. Oh my gosh. I haven't touched it. So there's been, if anything, it's, uh, you know, I, I sort of, and this, this analogy might be poor, but for me, the pandemic uh, is similar to having a child mm. in that. So there are some people that once they have a child or during the pandemic, they change, right? It's like, oh my God, I didn't realize I should spend time with my friends and family and the true importance of nature. And I never really looked at that tree or I never smelt that flower or I never took the time to, no, that's not me. I, you know, before, during, after a child, before, during, after the pandemic, I stopped, I smelled, I appreciated, I was grateful for, uh, so there, there hasn't been other than I, I've, I'm, I've been starting to feel it again, the good day, bad day, wash and repeat. Like some days I'm just depressed as mm -hmm. shit. Like just right. some days it just seems to really, it's not necessarily the social thing. It's just the feeling of helplessness that but I've had that before. So mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. a lot of these qualities I've had, for, for a while, so it hasn't um, changed anything with that. Um, it just, you, you know, you feel, you, feel, you feel more worse because there's a, a further sense of helplessness regarding the situation and, and concern, you know, mm. for, for so many people, like shit is getting bad and I'm fortunate enough to, for now, continue to survive, like eat, Mm -hmm. roof over my head but it's getting bad like people with the money and no job and what happens it's really horrible and it's the have i mean it's the one thing with snow piercer having just finished that and prior right. to the season finale talking about it aside from the climate change on the show and all of these things the thing that always resonated with me even prior to the pandemic which again has only highlighted something that has always been around is the haves and the have nots. Yeah. Snowpiercer is the haves, the first class and the thousand and one trains. You've got the tailies that have nothing. 
society nowadays. I mean, I just read something and I don't quote me about the, the billionaires during the pandemic have made more money in this given right. time than in like shit like that just drives me insane. I don't go down that wormhole too enough because I've got enough anxiety, depression, things in my head, but that really is disgusting. And the haves and have nots. And again, people that, you know, the, the, some, I heard, uh, I think it was on NPR, the $600 a month aid is going away at the end of the month. Yep. And that really helped people. Um, yeah. So I have friends scary. with kids and families who rely on that, you know, who've lost their job because they're in the industry or they're in a service industry or something else where they don't have a job anymore. They make less money. They took like a pay cut or a furlough. And so it's, I don't know, it, it makes you not want to get out of bed in the morning. Some days it does. And I know like today, that's why even things like this, sometimes I'm, I, I'll schedule them and this morning. I was like, gosh, oh, I should, I should probably just say I can't. Cause I was just, it was just not a good morning. It was just, yeah, just felt like crap. And then inevitably though, it's, of course the lessons are, and maybe this would be the lesson in the, what you asked about any lessons in the pandemic. I knew this before, but it's again, if you just do something, mm -hmm. you inevitably feel better. So like just doing this, I will feel better. And that's it's good. Like, doing Instagram lives. I've done a couple of those that I was like, oh, I, can't, I, just, I can't, I can't. And then you do them and you're like, ah, oh, it was good to interact. Like, yeah, especially with someone you've never met and you get talk to, to a new person. talk to a new person and express some ideas and, and just share with, with yeah. someone. And this is our connection. So it's, it is nice. Well, I appreciate you, know? you getting up for it and talking to me. I totally get that feeling. So really appreciate you being here. Um, so now we're going to get to the regular, um, interview questions. Now about that we've you. depressed the shit out of everybody. Now that everyone's more in the dumps than usual. No, um, no, th these are the important conversations. You know, I feel like if you just pretend everything's fine, that's adding to the problem. You know, it's okay to like be emotional. I think a lot of people are kind of low key depressed about things and they may not realize it yet but you know staying at home for months and months at a time and being anxious and ang like I'm tired of being angry all the time you know it really sort of takes a toll on you so I think it's okay to address that yeah well it should and again it should be open that's what again with Instagram yeah to, to go back to that is I share that I have depression I have anxiety yeah. I've I've got all sorts of things that I'm trying to deal with but the one thing that keeps me going is hope and the hope can be for a variety of reasons or for, you know, choose what you will fill in the blank. But I think it's important, especially when you are, you know, I'm no spokesman. I'm no, I don't get the, I understand it, but I don't get the celebrity culture or I wouldn't consider myself famous, but I obviously have some notoriety. So therefore, yeah, share, say it's okay to cry. It's okay to be depressed. And it's, really good to get help, you know, or ask for help or reach out. Pain is pain, man. Pain is pain. It is. Yeah. I oh think my God. We're, we're supposed to get positive and I just brought us back down. Fuck. Come no, on. No, it's okay. I think we track. should, I think we should keep digging. Um, <laughs> I have no problem with that. I could talk about this for forever. I know. A, oh, it'll probably open, crop open up again. Sore. Most people, they may not know, uh, you grew up in Canada, specifically uh, Calgary, or as you pronounce it, Calgary. Um, you are in the minority of that, but that's You've okay. You've done your um, research. I have. I'm in, uh, you know, I live in Los Angeles. So if you say it's Calgary, then I'll believe you. I don't care. You know, I don't have a stake in the game here. So uh, before you moved to New York, I'm just wondering what like a young Stephen Ogg was like. I mean, I, I believe, you know, nature versus nurture. I, we're born a certain way. Right. I mean, we're, we're just obviously our surroundings thrive, we can or not. Uh, but I think we're just born. I mean, I've always been sort of this, this thing and a bit of a, the class clown, you know, jackass meets melancholy drama queen thrown in there. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've, I've had this since I was a kid and yeah. So, I mean, after Calgary, 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 um, let's get it right. People. 
Calgary. I uh, I almost oh actually I'm wearing oh no I was gonna wear my Alberta shirt. This is a Calgary shirt. Um, I ended up living in Europe for about five years, wow. and and that was uh, I call Where those else? my. I did Italy for a year. Uh, it was London for a year, England. My mom's from England, so I went and, and spent time with my granddad there in Norfolk. And then uh, Paris was the longest. Paris was two years I spent there. Mm. So two, three, four years in total. Also lived in Montreal, lived in Vancouver, lived in Toronto for a summer. I did sort of this whole, I called them my uh, Dostoevsky Buster Keaton travels. Yeah. Uh, how you know, old like, were you during these? I, I left home. I was in first year university in Calgary at the University of Calgary. <laughs> and I had an opportunity in the summer to go to Toronto. And then I never went back. And wow. I, it, it was, I'd expected to live at home. I was like, I'm a mama's boy. I'm like, yeah, I'll just live in the basement. This is good. I didn't expect to be the traveler or I had no ambitions, but it was really my dad incredibly supportive man who was just like you have an opportunity school's always there work's always there and I think that also came from a man who worked his is is swear I should maybe I'll just not you can swear, swear. you can swear that? I don't care okay. I realize I have a potty mouth when I do these things that people good are about. this isn't okay. KTLA it's fine you can you can say whatever you want okay um so, you know, a man who was in a job like many people that they don't necessarily love and it's not their dream, but they stick with it and they they go in to work every day to provide for their family. And I think because of that, he saw I had opportunities and he was incredibly supportive and pushed me to do it because at first I didn't want to go. I was like, right. well, no, I'm in school. I'm in university. General studies, of course, because who knows what the hell I wanted to do. Right. But uh, he really pushed me and supported that. So then, yeah, it was Italy and I think then Montreal. I, I always have to ask my mother because I don't, I don't remember last week. So this is when I was 17, 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, we're talking. And so I, um, yeah, I just, I traveled and, and lived and, you know, in Paris, I lived in Henry Miller's place because I thought wow. that would help my, you know, I had read the Sexus Nexus Plexus trilogy and, I was like, that's going to help. And I'm going to sleep on the street under a bridge. And I was writing a lot at the time. And you just sort of, it's a rather Purell artistic mindset of you suffer for your art. Dumb. But you do these things. And, uh, and then after that, from Paris, it was New York, where it was for 25 years, New York. So you started acting there in New York, right? Is that, or was I it? I acted in, uh, in Calgary growing up. I did theater. Okay. I never, I never studied, but I got into, I apparently, again, my mother had to tell me this. My first performance, if you will, was in elementary school. So that's grade what? One through five, I think. Sure. I, yeah. would, perf I would perform Betty Boop in drag. Right. In drag. Wow. Why? I don't remember. I have no idea. I don't remember anyone saying don't. Uh, that was sort of my performance. And then in Calgary, there was a great, uh, the Calgary Youth Workshop was an organization in storybook theater uh, where you would develop plays and, and write. And I always looked older. So even at like 12, I looked 15. So I could, I was playing teenage runaways and playing the British soldier and the long, the short and the tall and all of these local theater productions that I did. And then that's, that's sort of, I had done that and eventually got around to, to New York after. So let's fast forward a little, you get, uh, you start getting different roles in TV and film. People might remember you from Law and Order or Third Watch. Um, who, and could then, forget? who could forget? Who could forget, forget you? <laughs> I read that you actually took a break from acting for a while. It says to build a house in the woods. Is that accurate? Is this, that's is true. this false information? That's true. Well, it was just, I mean, my friend was really the, uh, you know, he stayed up there and I would just bounce back and forth between New York. Uh, and I was doing at that time, a lot of voiceovers. Uh, that's okay. pretty much all I was doing. I kind of quit the acting uh, because again, after law and order third watch and I was like, what am I doing? Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to be on friends. I don't want to, I couldn't see what the goal and, and the guest stars, it was such a pecking order. And you're just like, this is not why acting's not fun anymore. It should be okay. fun. Yeah. But 
it was losing that. So yeah, then I just, basically I wanted to learn, I've always enjoyed you know, the tits and lipstick, the designing, all of that, but I want, I don't even know if tits and lipstick is a the term you can use nowadays. Probably not. I mean, I'm okay with it, but yeah, who knows? I mean, better to err on the side of caution. Yeah. So I like the interior design aspect of it and I wanted to learn more about the structure. So then it, do you, right after the cabin, do you go straight into GTA five production? I know you've answered a million questions about that. That was, that was pretty much what, that was my first uh, audition sort of, let me see if I still care, if I still give a shit about acting or if I still have the, not that it ever left, but it just, uh, it, that was my first opportunity to go audition again. And it was obviously for a video game, which I know nothing about, but I got to be, it was going to be based on me and it was going to be, you know, like a cartoon version. And it's going to be motion capture. So all of that sounded incredibly cool, like to be a cartoon character based on me. So that was my first sort of testing of the waters. And then, you know, obviously that worked out and it definitely re, uh, reinvigorated once I started working again that, oh yeah, this is, I'm good at this and maybe this is the only thing I can do yeah. <laughs> for better or for worse. Because I'm not going to go build another house. I'm not going to be a landscape architect. I love doing it all, but this is all I kind of really do. Yeah. And I don't know if you know this, but Chandler Riggs, he has his own channel where he streams and plays video games and he plays GTA five online and he plays as Carl and there's other people who come in and they play the other characters from the show. But then there's also like Santa Claus and Abraham Lincoln and they all like rob banks together. It's insane. So, wow. If you ever I didn't have, know like that. An, yeah. So onto I walking dead. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you hadn't really watched the show before or read the comics, but that's okay because, you know, Stephen, or Stephen Simon uh, was not in the comics. So you kind of went in it, you know, sort of blind. Uh, how did you initially book the role on the show? Uh, actually audition Sharon Bialy, uh, amazing casting director in LA. Uh, it was, you know, it was, it was an audition. Mm -hmm. where you go in and I think it was I think the sides were that speech Negan gives that Jeffrey gives once mm -hmm. I introduce him with the trailer yeah he opens a door and he's you know with the bat so that was the audition and yeah I think I think it was just that it was that one time and then pretty soon thereafter so I don't I don't know I just I remember the first you know first day on set it was I was uh, or it wasn't on set. It was when I went there for fittings and I was in the trailer, the makeup, hair and makeup trailer with Andrew. So it's just Andrew Lincoln and myself. And, you know, he's just a love. And I said, what's, you know, what's the state of this, the show? Like, where are we in this world? Cause I don't really watch it. And so we just hung out and spoke all while waiting for them to decide i think jeffrey had just got cast so they were waiting to decide who was gonna shave what so that was my first it's like who gets a mustache who gets a beard because we both have the similar right salt and pepper stuff. yeah so uh yeah whatever uh, he just i think went straight stubble and then i was i was uh, granted mustache ability Right. What was it like shooting that lineup scene? Because everyone's crying and it seems like all the, you know, emotional stakes are so high and obviously we're killing off two major characters. So there's that like, and that's, you know, you had been on the show before, but still it's one of your introductions into the show. Like, what was that like to like be on set for that? I mean, were people like doing intense prep work or? Uh, I mean, it was, it was just an intense, we were shooting overnight. So those are long nights. And it was this family that was breaking up. Like they all knew that their time together was coming to an end as this group. So there was a lot of emotion just regarding that of saying goodbye and the horrific nature with which they were going to be killed was not pleasant. And, uh, you know, everyone has their thing. I mean, certainly ever, it was funny because, Austin and I would, would always be, everyone loved to listen to music to prep. That was pretty much, it seemed like the walking dead thing was music. Right. Everyone would plug into their own music and, and sort of prep, which is, is a great way to get into a, 
a mindset. Uh, it was intense. I mean, that was the time when I was like, and again, Austin and I were just, cause we were standing across from each other. So we'd a lot of times be looking at the, Andrew certainly, uh, showed what it is to be number one on the call sheet and to be a leader. I mean, he, this, this man gave it during that intense time and he gave a thousand percent every, every time throughout the night. Not that everyone else didn't, uh, everyone did, but you know, drone shot, not even, you know, didn't have to be as close up, could be shot over just every time. So it was, it was a pretty amazing uh, experience for that you know, just watching the commitment and watching this, this passion that right. they all had. I've know, heard he's extremely things. method. Uh, what I call Andrew method? Well, I mean, he doesn't break his accent, so he's never talking in his British accent. He sticks with that, but I think he wants that for continuity more than mm -hmm. anything, just to keep that same, you know, that same, the, that voice of Rick Grimes. But Method, I mean, he was always, you know, he was always available to chat. He was always cordial. He was, you know, I wouldn't call the stereotypical method where, you know. Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah, like so self-involved and so <laughs> self-indulgent that they can't, you know, you have to call them the character name. You've got to, it just seems like a bit of a wanker thing to do because it's all about you and acting should be about sharing. One of some of my favorite scenes with your character is with Xander Berkeley and just the intimidation factors that you had. Do you practice like how you're going to react to each line beforehand or do you just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall in the moment? Just go for it. I mean, that's, and that's where Xander and I, since it's some of my first things with him, you quickly discover another actor's playing field, how they like to play. And Xander and I both shared our playing fields as in two actors that, are gonna test, we're gonna push, but we're also gonna listen and be responsive and dance. You know, it's not gonna be the same thing, take after take after take. So when you have that playing field and you're just in the moment, you just try different things, you know? Right. And sometimes, and then a, a good director and a showrunner, there'll be times where they say, you know, no. I mean, I remember this thing with them, that boardroom scene where, Negan takes Simon onto his knees mm -hmm. and we're like, ah, what's going to happen? Case in point with that of like trying that. And I thought I'm going to, I'm going to face him. I'm going to kneel. And this was during camera blocking or like a rehearsal. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to put my arms behind my back and I'm just going to stare at him, bash my head and like kill me. But you're going to mm -hmm. look me in the eyes, you know, like, yeah. let's, let's do this. So I made that choice. And then afterwards, I think uh, it was Greg. I think Greg McTierra might have been directing that episode. But sure enough, they were like, interesting choice, Stephen. But you're not doing that. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't remember that part. Yeah, um, you're not going to be facing Negan eye to eye. Turn around. So that's what happens is you, when you have a good uh, production and good people, you can try stuff and they can sometimes appease you. Uh, sometimes they just say that's that's not right because it's similar like with Snowpiercer. If all of these shows, Westworld, Snowpiercer, Walking Dead, if you don't know the entire world, because you don't, you get the script for that episode, that's it. You don't know what's happening. You do have to play very moment to moment. Mm -hmm. And then you have to trust that the showrunner, the director, the producers, they know the whole world. They have a good sense of it. So they can then sort of say yeah that's we you can't do that because it's not going to work over here but so they have a better sense of it than the actors generally you said on talking dead that you actually were not aware about simon's whole massacre of the men and boys in oceanside until you got that script which was super late into your character's arc and i think you've said that you would have played the character a little bit differently had you known that, um, was that something that you were upset about or was that something that like, I don't know, how, how does that affect you when you I mean, find I wasn't out that up, information? Uh, upset. The, the only thing is like, I don't need to be liked. Right. As, as, as a, as a character, like as an actor on doing a role, if he's, if he's an evil man, 
then your job is to portray an evil man. Now, mm -hmm. can that mean there are shades of evil? Of course. But am I doing an evil part hoping to be like? No. Because it's like what Xander did. Xander had a despicable character and people just hated his character. Yes. But that's acting. Like that's... Right. The, the more you hate a character, I think the better job the actor is doing. Unless it's a specific type of role that's just likable or charming. But I'm talking about someone who's maybe not so likable. My only fear when I heard that was because, again, I, I, you don't want to do something that is uh, horrible and then have him likable. Do you know what I'm saying? Like if he's, yeah. a, a, pedo if he's a pedophile, then let's, he, he should be a fucking hated, disgusting man. Your job is to represent that side because there's all these shades of humans and, and evil and atrocity. And so that's your job is to show so many evil. So that was my only concern. I don't know if I would have done anything different, mm. but it's certainly, it does help inform. But again, with these situations, you play moment to moment because you have no other choice. And all I do as an actor, which is how even Grand Theft Auto, the Trevor character, Simon, you know, a lot of, if there's this, the similarities between them all, is that each and every one of them, I had no fucking clue yeah. what was happening. I didn't have the full 750 pages of Grand Theft Auto. I didn't have the full 10 episodes of Westworld. I didn't have Snowpiercer, Walking Dead, none of them. So, mm -hmm. and especially with like, the Walking Dead, I, I was supposed to really just be a bit character that came on and kind of was a, you know, maybe people thought I was Negan and then I introduced him and that could have been it. I just pulled the curtain and showed Oz and then I left. Yes. But instead I was given an opportunity to continue on. And so I just consider with all these roles, I'm trying to pack as much, I always say like a Dagwood sandwich, as many layers so that if maybe he will be good the character mm -hmm. turns out good. So let me show a little goodness. Uh, let me show a little humor because maybe he'll be funny. Let me show a little darkness in case he's dark. So that's the only thing is if you are given, if you knew, let's say that he was, uh, he had massacred all these people. Would I have played him differently had I known that? I don't, I can't say for sure, mm -hmm. but I certainly would have had that possibly instead of leaning on something lighter in his character, his, you know, the, the expressions or whatever, I would have maybe just been a bit darker. So any glimmer would have been a dark glimmer. Does that make sense? It does, but you were a very dark character. So when that was revealed, it was a surprise, but it wasn't shocking. It wasn't like, we were like, yeah, that checks out. I mean, that Jesus right. Christ, it makes sense. But that's correct. Right. I mean, like, it was part of the Dagwood sandwich, like I said, so there was, all sure. of these things shown, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's kind of part of the business of, of when you don't know. And it's kind of the excitement of it too, is moment to moment. Just right. what am I doing now? And you're yeah. one of the characters who actually had almost a fair shot to, I mean, you were going, Negan was going to win that fight when, you know, your character died, but usually they're just killed sort of randomly or, you know, a Walker just like comes out of the ground and, you know, tears someone apart or someone gets beheaded with, you know, while they're tied up, at least you got to like sort of fight for it. So what was it shooting with Jeffrey that day? It was fun. I mean, it was, uh, you know, we both had, I think had, we both came in with the same idea as to what we wanted this fight to be, but it wasn't what they were giving us. Mm -hmm. So we had this initial of like, well, no, both Jeffrey and I agree. It should be this, like, I, you know, we both agreed it needs to be dirty immediately yeah. because physically I'll beat the shit out of Jeff. I'm just, I just will <laughs> yeah. I'll just get angry and just beat, beat him up. Yeah. Um, just physically being larger. So it's like, how are you, how are we going to make this believable? And I think, you know, we both initially wanted it very dirty and, and, you know, kicking me in the nuts to get me to, Oh, and then smashing my head, like really, you know, someone who's fighting to, to win, not to be mm -hmm. fair. Uh, because I think initially there was a lot of like, all of a sudden it was like, I was throwing haymakers and I could never punch him. And he was just like, <laughs> beat me up. And we were both like, no, because you know, that's not, that's not Negan. And Simon is not a big, oh, I'm going to try to, I think I can hit you. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. So it was fun to, to rehearsal. And of course, the greatest the point where that is, is during the stunt rehearsal when you're the choreography of it all. And they have, we both have our stunt doubles. And so they have the, because stunt people in general, bless them. But they can take, like, if it says in the script, uh, you know, Stephen knocks out Johnny. Yeah. Right? That's Stephen knocks out Johnny. So that's like, boom, right? The stunt choreography will be like, you know, okay, so I'm thinking you go like this and Johnny, you're going to duck and then you're going to do a, like you're going to spin up in the air and do a backflip. And then Stephen, you're going to like do splits and then you're going to flip over to the guy. Like, nah, it just says Stephen knocks out Johnny. Like, that seems simple. They love to add these layers. <laughs> which is awesome. But so sure. Jeffrey and I are watching it and this is like a four or five minute choreographed fight. And they said, this is what we're thinking. And so Jeffrey and I are both, and I think within the first 30 seconds, we look at each other, just start to laugh. So I was like, do you remember the first punch? I don't, I don't remember the first thing. Can we, can we go back? Um, so we had a good laugh with it. And then we, uh, it's again, one of those things that you want to be safe first and foremost. But then you start doing it and you just get into it and it gets pretty intense. And, uh, and then, you know, it, it was, it was, it was sad. Cause again, that was my last day. That was my last take. And that's again, saying goodbye to that family. Yeah. So it was that weird thing of you're amped up and you're, you know, you want to keep fighting. You want to get going cause you got the adrenaline and then you're saying bye. So you're crying and smiling and it's, uh, it's quite a, quite a rush of mixed emotions. Right. And you got to sit in the makeup chair for five hours and be a walker for, you know, yeah. uh, a few seconds. Uh, what, was the, what was that like? It was, awesome. was that your last take or was your last take the fight? Uh, it was the zombie was after. Yeah, okay. The zombie was after. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing because they do such a great job, such an incredible job. So it was wonderful to be a part of that process. Mm -hmm. um, I wish after all that time, I had a little more screen time. Because mm -hmm. I thought that the zombie I did was pretty darn good. It was this it was. whole sort of guy who was now battling with still fighting to kill, but now he's realizing. So it was just fun to play around with it, uh, with that. But then, you know, we've got the, we rack focus to, uh, to Negan talking more. And I'm like, I think we, we've heard him a lot. Can't we just, can we just keep it on me for a bit? Just indulge a little me bit. for a little bit. Instead of like, <laughs> zombie simon Ugh. and there's negan talking yeah. again i always wonder like if i was in alexandria and this was real and there was like a faction like negan's coming and stealing my shit every two weeks would i mean aren't there like a billion abandoned neighborhoods left in america like wouldn't you just move there's a lot of things you just can't think about like why yeah. is, <laughs> like i remember that night with the trailer like Jeffrey's wearing a leather, Negan's got in a leather jacket because it was cold those nights. So that makes right. sense. But I was in a short sleeve shirt. Everyone else has jackets. Why am I in a short sleeve shirt? And then during the day when it's summer and it's hot, I now put on a bomber jacket. Right. <laughs> it's like, why don't people, when it's hot, take off your jacket? And when it's cold, put on a jacket. Yeah. The <laughs> A lot of plot holes. Um, and we, are you still nice surprised? Hair all the time. It's like, how did, where's all the hair gel and hairspray? Because that right, um, pretty incredible. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I always wondered that too. Like Negan seems to always have a new haircut every time he shows up. Um, He's looking good. Looking good. Uh, <laughs> are you surprised? I don't know if you keep up with what's happening with the shows that after you leave them. But, you know, you probably know that, you know, Jeffrey's still on and they're doing sort of this Negan redemption arc uh, right now. Like, does that surprise you that he's still, you know, such a prominent character in the show, considering everything his character did? Um, no, I mean, nothing, nothing surprises me, really. I mean, it's, you know, the show's, it's what, 10, 11 years? 10 years, yeah. So there's, you know, I mean, Jeffrey is, is a very dynamic fun to watch actor as Negan. So yeah, I mean, why not keep that going, right? It's entertaining. Makes sense. He is entertaining. Yeah. yeah. Strange. Um, dreamy too. So dreamy. Uh, so you've been on Snowpiercer and a trailer for season two just came out. Have you guys completely shot everything? Did it? I think so. Or I'm pretty sure. Am I wrong? I feel I like they know. had some kind of season two something. So is that, is that all shot and done and ready no we've got uh we still have two, uh, two episodes left 
of season gotcha. two. Yeah. So there's two left to film, but like everyone, I mean, who, who knows Just when? Wait and see. Um, yeah. You once said that you were more inspired by musicians and artists than you were inspired by actors. And some actors inspire you, but mostly it's of sort course. of the, the other side. Um, so I'm wondering what it's like acting alongside W. Diggs, who obviously had, you know, such a iconic role in Hamilton. And like, was he done talking about that? Or like, did you ever like talk to him <laughs> about that kind of thing? Like, cause like, you know, he, he did like what, like eight shows a week for like four years or something or. Well, my, uh, my dirty little, uh, it's not even a secret, I don't think. But I have a lot of these. I never saw Hamilton. Oh, well, I mean, a lot of people who aren't, you know, elite New Yorkers didn't see it. Thankfully, it's on Disney Plus now. Shout out. Well, I had a friend that uh, ended up going into it. And uh, I was going to, I had tickets, but I, for some reason, I never went. So it's it's very unfortunate that I never saw it. Yeah, I, I never had that as a starting point with David. Oh, okay. I'm like, let's talk about let's talk about this Hamilton. So I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, part of, I guess, I was about to say part of my charm is my ignorance, but I don't know if it's charming nor if it's complete ignorance. But yeah, when it comes to especially TV shows and I, I don't watch a lot of things, I want to, I just don't get into them. Uh, so David was, again, it's more just you meet someone and you connect really deep or you just kind of connect or you don't connect. Right. David was, is just one of those human beings that you just love. Like he is such a, a wonderful, wonderful human being. So that's, that's what I care about. And that's what I gravitate towards. Uh, I don't care what you've done or what you're doing or anything like that. I want to know there's you know, two people in this world, assholes, not assholes. And right. that's, that's it for me and he is such a lovely man and I mean seem 90% of the time in our scenes I'd end up somehow breaking down at some point just because of that struggle of like how could I harm someone like this you right know? yeah so he he was wonderful Never, everyone was great I've been been really lucky to meet these incredible people and form these amazing French excuse me friendships and uh it's just it's pretty awesome everyone's in quarantine right now and they're worried about, you know, what they're doing during their time and how they're staying in shape. You seem like you are in excellent shape. What is your, are there any pieces of advice? Is, is it, is it lean meats and sit-ups? Like what, what's your I, secret here? I honestly, I mean, I was cycling a lot, but I'm not now. Uh, I honestly, I think because again, I've just, I was doing yoga. I started getting into yoga, which my sister was into. I just like YouTube. There's these amazing yoga with Adrian, Boho Beautiful. Uh, and you can do 20 to 40 minutes, put the mat out in the morning in front of the TV. That's great. But I haven't been doing that in like a, a week. And my mother said this morning, you've got to get back on that. I think that's going to help your mood. Oh. Because honestly, I mean, the past, I've just been depressed, like just getting up and no energy, no motivation. Uh, I used to do spin classes. I mean, so, so I don't work out. I drink beer, but I'm an ectomorph. So when I drink beer, it looks like I've been working out and things get, grrr. but no, there's been no push-ups. There's been no, sadly, I'm just knock on wood and do, I want to do more. I wish I had like a spin bike because I can't really go cycling right now. Uh, I try to go on nice long walks. You know, in LA, they call them hikes, but they're not hikes, like they're walks. Yeah. yeah. Up hills, down hills. Uh, yeah. But my knees, my knees are fucked. So I'm like, my knees hurt now. And so I'm just falling apart in every sense of the word and just trying to, I really should just get back onto yoga. So I think yoga is wonderful. I mean, I, I love spinning. I, w I want to start skipping again. Skipping. But I just haven't, yeah, I used to love skipping. <sighs> I mean, it's the I've, fastest way to get anywhere, honestly. Oh, try to frown and skip. <laughs> I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it right now. I'm going to put a mask on, go in my yard, <laughs> do that. And neighbors are going to call the police. Yeah. But you, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very tough thing. You won't be able to frown. You should do some kind of memoir just so someone else doesn't write it and get all the facts wrong, you know? Well, that's what I figure my, my, like my Instagram, in a sense, is like my epitaph. I think I even wrote that on one of my, my posts. Wow. 
but this is wow. my epitaph. This is what I, I leave behind. So if I'm going to leave this behind, I want it to truly reflect what and who I am. It's tweaked, but that's essentially what it is. It's, you know, I, I talk to you like I write, like I talk to my mom, like I talk to a therapist, like I talk, like talk to a kid. It's just, that's, that's my epitaph is this is, this is what I have to offer the world. This is what I have done. And wow. goodbye. <laughs> Time to die. I think uh, other than a James Bond uh, film name, I think that's a great place to end. Uh, Steven, thank you so much for talking to me. Um, especially through the technical difficulties and everything it is. I don't know if you've found this. It's weird to talk to uh, new people during quarantine because you get so used to your circle, you know, being at home. So it's a delight talking to you. Thanks for taking it. Is. That's what I was saying. Like, this is now our social thing. It's, this it's, is it. It's, it's a fucking weird time, man, but it was a pleasure. I thank you very much. Yeah, and, uh, of and good luck with everything. Stay safe. Yes. And Wear stay healthy. Well, you too, man. Thank you so much. All right, Cheers. see you, buddy. And that was my interview with Stephen Ott. Guys, I told you, he is an absolute delight. And please go follow him on Instagram. As we talked about, he has his own Instagram, which he uses to write poetry and update us on his life. And then he has a second Instagram where it's just his musings. I'm obsessed with the blog og or the og blog. Og blog, blog og, something like that. It is fantastic. I, I think it's in the link in his bio if you go to his normal Instagram page. So please check that out, guys. He is uh, he's the gift that keeps on giving. All right, uh, before we wrap up, we are going to be doing stray arrows. These are observations we had about the episode that didn't quite make it into the show, but we're just going to force them down your throat anyway. That sounds bad. All right. Um, <laughs> Push him through. Doing this year. <laughs> All right, my stray arrows, uh, I, I kind of mentioned it up front, but testicular heft is something that, you know, Simon says to Gregory, <laughs> and it is fantastic. And I love how creative they get with, you know, Negan and Simon, and at least they gave him some memorable lines uh, as he went Oof. out. So that was nice. Alexander, what are your stray arrows? Uh, my stray arrows are a little bit related to your stray arrows, uh, specifically the testicular heft stray arrow. Uh, yes. I and I don't say I don't mean this in a bad way at all. And it's maybe just because we're living in such a time of like cancel culture, people who are racist and misogynist, and just we're all we're confronting all that right now. But I found myself looking at this episode through a somewhat feminist lens and being like, "Whoa, this is uh, this episode is essentially a giant dick measuring contest." Like, oh yeah, I, I bet that actually happens. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and it's like Gregory and Simon, then Simon and Dwight, and then Simon and Negan, and then Dwight and Negan, and then Negan and Simon, it's the big one, and then a little bit Gregory and Dwight. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, it's just... No, I mean, I mean, literally, I think that there have been times where Negan has had saviors pull their dicks out and thwap <laughs> yeah. it on the table. Like in a circle. I think you're and right. Like All right, I get out the tape right. measure. And they're like, oh, God damn it. And then Negan just measures Lucille, and they're like, Negan, that's not your dick. And he's like, kill him. So, it is. It's um, my second Well, dick. I mean, just, and it's also, like, just dick. the Shakespearean level <laughs> dick speak alone. Like, not yes. only do we have, like, the plane of good testicular heft, we also have Gregory saying to Simon, This is politics, the bare knuckled nad mash. <laughs> <laughs> Magnificent Gregory. That, that, is, that is really good. Um, yeah, so. Shakespearean level of dick speak is also <laughs> the, uh, the, the code phrase into Alexandra's vault at home, by the way. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Woody, uh, take us out. What are your stray arrows from this episode? Just one. Uh, and I want viewer, listener, mom and dad, I want you to take this with you as you go through your day. <laughs> uh, picture Eugene talking to the, the bullet uh, making crew and like his motivational speak. And like, first of all, put that underneath like explosions in the sky from Friday Night Lights. And you've got an entirely different, more motivating speak. Um, but I want to know about a pre-apocalypse Eugene who's a manager at a subway and has this same sort of like verbosity and like <laughs> motivational talk to be he like. One, I, I, that was 100% his job. It had to have been, right? Absolutely. And like, yeah. And they didn't do a great job. Like they gave out too many free cookies. They oh, were pretty yeah. lax with like the tiller. But at the same time, like they got stuff out. Um yeah, and the, but Eugene locked up every night because he doesn't trust anybody else to uh, to uh, secure the perimeter or something like that. Um, <laughs> and I wish that I could improv a whole bit about Eugene as a subway manager, but like somebody somebody go and do that. Thank you guys for listening to the six of you who stayed the full length. And um, without further ado, happy birthday to Nate. Happy birthday, Nate. <laughs> happy birthday, Nate. I think next week we should actually play 
his original voicemail. Yes, he doesn't recall it. He doesn't know how much he means to us and how we think about him literally every week. 